everything. So John was a former member of the Sussex Amateur Radio Society. <coughs> He hasn't been since 1984, so he's not a regular. In fact, quite a regular. But welcome. Yeah, and as uh, long as you don't charge too much, we'll even put it on the air for you. <laughs> <laughs> tonight we are on Zoom. So yes. welcome, Zoomers. And those are still Bernie, trying to get Bernie in. says good evening. Welcome to the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> 21st century? Yeah. Hang on, what happened to the 19th? <laughs> <laughs> really, the next? Right. Okay, so there you go. All yours, John. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, nice to be here after this long break. If you take the next slide, yeah. just a little bit about me. My name is Johnson, G A U R E, and um, uh, that, <laughs> ah, yes. that was me about eight years ago um, when I lived in Harrow. And actually, there's a piece of kit here which a member of the club should recognise uh, on the uh, on this on the stack there. Anybody recognise it? Ken, <laughs> uh, that's, that's Ken's AR, I bought that uh, AR40 from Ken when I was about 14 and it's still doing good service. <laughs> so thank you, Ken. <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually in my, in my shed at the moment because I haven't put the aerials up again since I've moved, yeah. but, uh, but that was doing sterling service at the time. Oh. Um, and the, uh, the next slide. Yes, yeah, uh, I've just been told you're not in, not in camera. We're not in not, camera. That's all right. That's it. And uh, that's uh, G A U R E Mobile. I lived in uh, lived in Harrow, and the noise level got so uh, ridiculous. And then somebody said, "Why don't they, Why don't you just buy yourself a mobile shack?" So my wife bought that for me when I was fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, <laughs> well, what you need to do is every time there's some QRM, you just <laughs> use lots of choice words, and in the end, the YL decides that you're better off <laughs> in the green land rover. So you you can put whatever gear you like inside that thing. So. Mm -hmm. I've got a job for two people, so who's going to pay attention? Um, I've got two words here, and mm -hmm. capacitance yeah. and cooling. But I think actually cooling, I'll use also, if I use the word heat as well, then whoever, uh, let me see if I can give this one to you. Uh, and uh, over here, pass that one down, maybe. Every time I say the word to do with heat or cooling, you need to raise that. <laughs> If I say capacitance, you need to raise that. <laughs> no, that's not a smiley face. Um, cooling has got a, cooling has got a smiley face, but heat hasn't got a smiley face. So if you could roll it one more. Apologies about the. Oh yes, the other thing is the rule here is there's no such thing as a stupid question. So do you just are you happy for people, any, for people on Zoom yeah, to ask questions if I pick it up? Right, yeah, okay. absolutely. Right, so I'll try and keep the pace on because I've got quite a lot here and I'll try and show you stuff, but we can go along one more time. And um, so, yeah, that's, uh, so to make an RF amplifier, we need active devices. So we're either talking about a valve or a transistor and um, capacitance. Come on, Charlie. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that was a test. Okay, so one thing about um, uh, power transistors, um, and I bought the whole load of them here. This is 2N3055 audio power transistor, obviously, um, or can be used in power supplies, etc. Why can't we use that device to make a linear amplifier or an RF amplifier? And the main reason is capacitance. Hey! <laughs> but we can get the heat out of this device. Oh, that was just a test, yeah. So this device is made, uh, obviously it's a power device and it's made to be put in the heat sink to get the heat out. Um, the other device, the other problem with this device is the outside of the device is the, is the drain and the drain is the live bit, it's the bit with the RF on it. And when we mount this onto the heat sink, we have to put an insulator on there and then mount it on the heat sink. So what have we got between here and the heat sink? A lot of capacitance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's the other reason why, as soon as you try increasing the frequency, all the time the capacitance is actually shorting the RF out. At audio frequencies, it doesn't matter, but at RF, capacitance is really against you. So, um, so um, 
And what it does is it, uh, first of all, raises the input, uh, or sorry, it drops the input in pinks, it, it shorts out the output of the device, and there's a, uh, a third capacitor. There's a third capacitor. Uh, so if you take a, a, a device with three legs on it, it doesn't matter if it's a bipolar transistor or a FET, generally, it's, you know, this one would be brown, that would be the drain, that would be the gain store. So you've got three capacitances. One is here. Uh, and the other one is there. Um, this uh, and, and the third, third one is here. So this is the drain capacitance. That is the input capacitance. This is the output capacitance. Input capacitance. You can just hold it up. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> this one here is the nasty one because what it's doing is it's connecting, it's a pass between the input of the amplifier and the output of the amplifier. And the problem with that is that if it's in phase, you get positive feedback, it will start oscillating. And if it's out of phase, it'll actually cancel the, uh, cancel the gain of the amplifier. You're putting some of the, this is in antiphase to the input. So most of the time, this uh, capacitance, what's called Miller capacitance, will actually kill the gain of the transistor. So you put the transistor in, this, if, it, if it's too large, you will end up with no gain. So, <clears throat> Um, well, we've talked about heat, yeah. and um, so one of the ways uh, you get around this sort of problem is to make smaller devices, and then if you make smaller devices, you end up with less capacitance, and, <laughs> capacitance, and, um, and, and then you can also spread the heat out. And so here's uh, an example here, and here's for the guys online. Uh, this was a broadcast, this was, uh, it fell out of a broadcast transmitter. Actually, this was a prototype for the first uh, digital television uh, transmitters that went in. Um, and if you look at, if you look at this uh, here, um, again, I don't know if you can see it online, yeah. but um, you come a bit closer, I, I, can, sure I can actually see the devices here. The glasses. So the signal comes in and you've got two devices here, and then you've got another two devices here. And then there's another two devices here, and then finally there's two big output devices here, and it finally all gets combined and comes back out of this cable here. So this was a broadcast amplifier. I'll, I'll cover it later. I'll come back to this later on. Um, television covers 470 megahertz to 860 megahertz, which is almost double the frequency. And this amplifier is meant to be flat over that whole thing. <coughs> yeah, this right. is a, another subject I'll come back to. So, um, so we run on to the next slide. Um, valve types, yes. Yeah, so let's take a, let's take a valve. Um, here's a um, little uh, Brimer uh, six AM four, which actually this is a prototype. <laughs> it was never actually manufactured. It's quite an interesting valve, this one, but it's probably about a watt. Right, so that's the one watt valve. And then um, have I got something a bit bigger. I think it's a microwave. Um, so then uh, let's go up to something a bit bigger. So that's in glass. This is a, um, oh, what's it called? Um, I can't remember the number now. But anyway, that's about a, a 250 watt tube. So sort of a, a modern equivalent to something like an 813. Um, number's gone out of my head. I've got the CD number on it. Um, but then when you start getting more than that, what we're trying to do is get the heat out of this device um, by radiating the anode. So the anode in this device is actually designed to glow red hot and, um, and you get the, the waste heat that comes out, um, uh, comes out through the anode like that. Um, you have to blow the blow it. Now, <coughs> to go up in power, we had to do something a bit more clever. So out came the beginnings of the metal ceramic tubes. So now we're starting to use, and you'll recognize this is a famous amateur radio uh, 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 tube, this one for two meters, 70 cents, etc. So, and so the idea with this device is actually, if you look at it, the valve is actually quite small. The bulk of this here is the chimney on it, which is what's cooling it. So this is a 250 watt tube, thank you, <laughs> 250 watt tube, but it is being cooled by the by this large anode on there. And if you compare it against this, this is actually a higher power tube than this one. And because it's smaller, it's still got the power, but it's smaller. Because it's smaller, there's less capacitance. 
so um, so now now we're starting to cook on gas. So um, I can't see on that. No. So you're doing all right, John. I've got a comment here that says yes, yeah, really good view on Zoom for burning. Right. So you're doing all right. So let me go up a bit more. <laughs> now we are getting set <laughs> So this is a, a broadcast tube, NL 347 similar sort of construction, metal ceramic. But this is about a, a four kilowatt tube. Yeah. That'll do. Um, yeah, I mean, that would make a nice linear, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, and not only that, it's good up to 860 megahertz as well. So, you know, it do, do 70 centimeters as well, very nicely. Um, you need about 5 kb on uh, 5 kb to, uh, to get that working. And then, if you want to up the, up the ante a bit more, <laughs> then it's fine. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't tube. expect to hold this up for very long, folks. <laughs> this tube here, again, I don't know if you can see it. But, so, this is 120 kilowatts. BBC. 120 kilowatts. Yeah, it's sort of BBC type of thing. And um, uh, that takes uh, 10 kV. Uh, and the filament on here um, is um, uh, six volts at 90 amps. Ooh. Ooh, <laughs> nice. Just like continuously trying to start your car, just running the filament. <laughs> so, yeah. But um, obviously, the, uh, the issue with it, and you notice I've actually parked it on top of the mm. leg. <laughs> um, <laughs> just bring that down so they can see it. Okay. So there's a 46250. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, John. That gives you an idea. <laughs> um, so all we're doing is we're just making the tube bigger and bigger and bigger. But does it help going up in frequency? No. Um, so there are uh, techniques to try and go up in frequency. This is a, a um, FET 22, I think it's called. If you look at that. What they've done is they've tried to shorten the lead inductance. They've made the capacitance very small because the components inside are very small, but they've also tried to limit <coughs> the lead inductance as well. And that's why they've got these um, components around the outside. But again, you can't get much heat out of it. So it's very low power. Um, this device here is um, what they've done. This is actually a Klystron. And with a Klystron, if you, know, uh, you can imagine the valve, what you've got is uh, you've got the uh, the, uh, the cathode and you've got the, uh, the green and the anode. It takes time for the electrons to uh, to come off the cathode to get up to the anode uh, to create the uh, to create the current. Now, what can happen in the end is when you start putting a faster and faster signal into the grid, I turn the grid positive. And the electrons don't actually get to the anode before it's time to go negative again. So you have the time delay through the tube, through the valve, that actually stops the, the, the actual valve stops working because it just can't work fast enough. The electrons can't, fast, can't pass fast enough. So by making the valve, making the electrodes closer and closer together, you actually speed it up. So you get to a point where it still doesn't work. So there is another technique where what you do is you actually have a, you make the grid positive, you have your cathode, you make the grid positive so the electrons go shooting towards the grid, but actually shoot through it. And then what you do is you put the anode, but you make the anode negative. And so what happens is the electrons bounce back, so you end up with electrons going forward and coming back, and then finally hitting the grid and going off. And that is how a, a klystron works. What you do is you, you make a, a cavity uh, around the uh, around the, uh, this area here, so as the electrons are passing, it's like blowing over the top of the milk bottle. So here's your uh, here's your milk bottle, you sort of, and the electrons are whizzing past in the milk bottle, and it starts oscillating. And that is what this is. So you make that one negative, you make that one positive, and there's the grid. And the only connections on the bottom here really are the filaments.
So that's a client, that's a small client strong, but that's generally used as an oscillator, not an amplifier. So I really shouldn't have included it. But. <laughs> um, so, and then uh, we then end up with uh, the White House towers, or one of these now. This thing here is an IFF unit from the 1950s. Um, so um, you put lots of volts on there, volts on here, and you plug your aerial in here. And on one side, there was a uh, um, receiver oscillator. On the other side, there's a transmit oscillator. And in the middle here, there's a, um, a switch, which is just a glow tube. Um, but both the receiver and the and then the IF uh, came out of here. Sorry, this is the IF. The IF came out of here, and it's probably about 90 megs or something into a big amplifier. So this is called a lighthouse tube. Down a bit, John. So, right, right. Yeah. Um, uh, 2C42, etc. And again, what they've done is they've put the electrodes very close to each other, but not much power. But um, this was good enough to um, to make an IFF. What's interesting about this, by the way, is the front panel. And these are the tuning for the three counties. Be beautiful piece of work. Um, but um, if you look at the front panel, there's actually positions in the front panel for explosive charges. So um, obviously you don't want the enemy to get hold of your IFF. And the, what they what they are actually doing the, the explosives were actually aimed at this point here and this point here, which were the two cavities for the receiver and transmitter. So they get one, but you can't rebuild the cavity. And it's beautifully built in the mechanics. Is mm. Too good to throw away. <laughs> uh, then finally. Um, we move on to a different style altogether on the tube front, and this is what's called travelling wave tube. And this is the amplifier that's even used on uh, all the interstellar um, uh, probes, um, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, etc. Had two, not this particular one, but it had two of them, um, mainly because um, I'll quickly explain how this works. Um, so, what you had is uh, your cathode at one end with a heater on it, and then you have a, um, an anode with a grid here and an anode there. And what happened in the help? And so this gets hot, and electrons are attracted towards the anode like that. And um, <clears throat> there's some magnets and things around it to keep this beam very, very narrow. And it's a bit like a television screen, you know, the old uh, CRTs, the beam was going across. So all they did here was they put a, um, in this particular case, they put an antenna on it, which is helix on the input. So there's your in. And then further down, you put another helix here, and there was your output. And <clears throat> what happens is, is the electrons are going down like this, doing nothing apart from heating the anode up, as they collide with the anode. But as you start to put an RS signal into, the, into this antenna here, the electrons, instead of being a continuous stream, the electrons start to actually bunch like this uh, with, the, with the waveform coming through. And those bunches are then being uh, accelerated by the, uh, by the power supply, the positive supply. And then at the other end, this same, uh, this same information, it's the same information, it's just got a lot more energy in it, and the next antenna just plucks it off at the other end. And so, there's the travelling wave tube. So in this particular case, the electrons aren't stopping, starting, stopping, they're continuously going. You're just relying on the bunching effect as opposed to the um, switching the beam on, switching it off. These things you can do in tubes. You can't do in some So um, but, uh, on the disadvantage of this, obviously, is it's got a filament on it, and the filament's got a finite life. And so on the Voyagers, for instance, they would have left that running continuously, I, I guess. Um, or at least uh, it wasn't in use, so they've turned the current down and not switched it off. Um, that, that's, it's the filament which is the, the weak part of the whole system. I checked the filament on this one and it's good. One day I might fire it up, you need about 20 kV or something to make it work. <laughs> So, okay, so um, cut, the only one I didn't be, bring with me because I couldn't find it was the acorn valve, but the acorn valve again was an American idea 
where they made a little capsule and all the wires came out around the outside. It was the top and the bottom came together and then all the wires came out around the outside. And the idea was it, uh, it had very little inductance. And because it was small, it had very little capacitance. Okay. Next slide. Oops, hang on, missed that. Try it again. Okay. All right. Okay. So transistor types. The word transistor actually comes from trans resistance. So um, it's a it is a resistor, um, but you can control it remotely. Hence trans resistance. And um, uh, so you can uh, make transistors out of um, uh, 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 different semiconductors. The original was made from germanium, and what we're looking for is um, like a, you're looking for a blank page. It's a bit like you're looking for a, a blank piece of paper. And uh, in the periodic table, germanium, silicon, etc., all in the same area where they're not quite a conductor, but they're not quite an insulator. They're sort of just in between. And so you can actually influence whether they're a conductor or not by uh, implanting other 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 elements into it. Um, so we started off with uh, germanium, then moved to silicon, and the bulk of uh, everything that's uh, running in here, computers, uh, all these transistors I bought with me, bulk of it is all silicon. Um, got one here somewhere, oh, yeah, somewhere, <laughs> which I made um, using uh, this last material, um, GAN. <laughs> so uh, I'll just quickly go through it. So you've got germanium, nobody makes germanium transistors these days because um, they're very prone to some leaky. Uh, yeah, and if you get hot, they release, they release carriers. So they uh, start conducting just due to the heat rather than the fact that you've tried turning them on. So silicon's been used for many years. Silicon carbide is a new material where they're mixing carbon with silicon. And the reason for that is uh, it, it conducts the heat better. Um, and then uh, silicon germanium uh, is used because uh, it's, it uses the advantages of silicon and germanium. Silicon can be a bit quicker. So um, in the transit of uh, electrons or holes or whatever you want to call it, the electric current through it could be quicker with germanium. So silicon germanium is used in your phones for things like um, uh, Wi-Fi, low power Wi-Fi and um, you know, five gigs and stuff like that. The chips inside will be made of silicon germanium. Um, gallium arsenide, GAAS, uh, that's a, again a mix of materials and that has always been used on transistors for high frequency use, uh, traditionally used on the, um, the satellite connections at six gigs and um, that sort of stuff. And it's being overtaken now. Almost everything now, uh, com, uh, cellular wise, etc., is all being uh, they're using this new material called gall gallium nitride, GAN. Um, very fast, move. it's like a little racing car compared to silicon. But uh, you wouldn't want to use that amplifier. Quite tired, actually. Um, wherever I put it. Um, it's in a box here somewhere. Um, that one hiding on oh, there. It's one under here. No, 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 no. Um, oh, here it is. So, um, so this is a uh, this is a GAN amplifier, and uh, so what we wanted was a, or what the what we wanted was she was a, an amplifier which uh, went from I think it was like a ten megs to one gig, I think it is. 10 megs to one gig, that's 10 megs to 100 megs, 100 megs to 200. But, you know, if you look at the number of times the frequency is doubling there, it's massive. So to do that, you need a device with a very low capacitance. Um, because obviously as the frequency goes up, you want to use all these capacitors to have as little effect as possible. And as the frequency is going up, they're all starting to, to work against you. So if you start off with something which is almost not there, it really helps. So this is like a little racing car in there that's running at 10 megs. And so that's why it's covered in ferrite, if you look at it. Mm. So, um, but it does work and it is amazingly flat. Um, the only thing was, I'll just quickly say, this was a very early uh, GAN device and um, they actually, when they made them, they, they, the process was dirty and all sorts of little ions were inside the GAN, GAN in nitride that shouldn't have been there. And um, when you started biasing, uh, you know, like when you bias your uh, uh, PA valves, etc., um, it had some funny jump, it was jumping all over the place and you applied some RF and then the 
the DC current changed when you like put a million watt of RF in and suddenly the current dropped by 500 milliamps. It's like, what's going on? So it's just um, a dirty transistors. Strange. But, uh, so, um, uh, so, yeah, so the, these different materials have different um, FTs, which is what we were discussing earlier on. The FT is the, uh, effectively the speed of the material itself. And uh, the current density is uh, how much current you can get through a square, uh, I'd say a square centimetre, if you had a square centimetre of silicon, how much current can you actually get to it before it just runs out of carriers? And so these different materials have, uh, have different uh, effects, like that um, Then if we come on to the transistors, the original transistors were bipolar transistors, we're all used to those. Um, then out came the JFET, and it, the JFET was uh, like a, um, it's used a junction like a bipolar, um, but it um, uh, but it was actually a FET, field effect transistor. So again, I'm going to keep going through this. So bipolar transistor, this is what we call a bipolar transistor. You actually have to put current into the base, which actually goes down there. Like this. You have to put current in, actually milliamps of current in there. And then what will happen is current will flow down there. So you switch your device on. But it actually needs current to make it work. Now with a FET, field effect transistor, what happens here is the uh, same thing. You've got a, a battery or a bulb or whatever you want in here and, and that sort of supply. And, but here, you don't need to put a current in. You only need to put a voltage there and it will switch on. And so what you can do, you put your finger between there and there. <coughs> And it will switch on. And if you go between there and there, it will switch on. And if you put it back there and switch it on and take things off, it will stay on because the charge is still on there. And then you put between there and there, it will switch off again. You can't do that with a bipolar transistor. So that's the difference. This is a current device and this is a voltage device. So, um, and um, the, uh, the method, and inside uh, this gate, this is called the gate. And the, uh, the, gate material, the gate actually sets up an electric field that charges up like a capacitor. And uh, the reason the word MOSFET, M-O-S-F-E-T, field effect transistor, MOS, is metal oxide. So it's actually using metal with the gate. And then the insulator in this capacitor is silicon oxide. And that's uh, why it's called a MOSFET. Unfortunately, and that works very well for silicon, but unfortunately, these other materials like uh, gallium nitride, etc., there's no such thing as gallium oxide. So you can't, you don't have this simple capacitor that you can make. And so, uh, the, although they're faster, they've got, their, um, they're sort of different. Um, and, and then if I go uh, talk about the next thing is depletion mode and enhanced mode. And depletion mode, uh, is like a valve. If you put bolts on a valve and do nothing with the grid, the valve will conduct. So, um, I'm trying to valve this So, here's a valve, and uh, you put lots of bolts on there, this round, and if you put lots of bolts on, the electrons will rush across here like a diode. Um, if you want to stop it, you have to put a negative voltage on here to, to, to repel the electrons. So this is a depletion mode device. In, in semiconductor talk, this is a depletion mode device. It's always on unless you switch it off. Now the enhanced mode device, uh, like has a, it's like a valve with a built-in battery. It's like uh, there's already, it's already biased off inside. So it won't conduct until you actually put a positive voltage on it. And um, again, it makes it very nice. Um, uh, because having to put negative voltages around the place can be a bit of a pain. Um, and actually, this amplifier here, wherever I put it down, this one here, uh, because this is a, a GAN amplifier, uh, if you connect up the, um, the drain supply uh, without connecting up, this is the anode, if you don't connect up the grid, it will just conduct like a valve. You actually have to put a negative voltage on here. If you don't, you normally blow the device. Um, it's either that or the power supply has to go into current limit first on their own. Um, so, and then the other thing about these, uh, 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 about the, uh, the way transistors are built, sorry to go, I mean, covering the actual bits that go in the amplifier, we'll get to the amplifiers in a minute. Um, the, uh, the other thing about it is, is that uh, obviously you've got to get the heat 
out of the device. So here's your block of uh, a semiconductor, and um, what you want to do is um, uh, is cool it. So what you do is you mount it on on a on a uh, on a flange, and then you screw the flange down onto a heatsink, like um, like this. So there's the semiconductor on the top. And then there's the uh, there's the flange underneath, and that's what's bolted down. Um, but if your transistor is sitting on the top here, um, and you've got the um, uh, the, tr the traditional one, the original one, the uh, the gate would be on the top here. The um, the sort of bed. This is the gate. That's the source, and that's the drain. Yeah, so this bit here is the bit with the RF on it. This is the bit you don't put your finger on when it's working. <laughs> this bit's all right. So what happened on the original devices was that was the uh, the drain was actually underneath. It was at the bottom, and the source and the gate were on the top, which meant to the outside world when you um, actually you have to sort of put a frame around this whole thing and put some connections on it. So inside, you have to connect, put some wires between the gate and the gate connected to the outside well. The source, you've got to connect down to the flange, and then the drain, you've got to connect up to there. It's all a bit of a mess. But they made them like that for years, until cellular radio came out. And then they thought, hmm, can't we do something a bit different here? Because this is called a vertical, the actual whole thing is um, built in a vertical manner like this. You know, this is the gate, and that is source and this is the frame. So what they thought was why don't we just tip it on its side? So they came out with a different idea. They said uh, what we'll do is we'll put the drain on this side, and we'll put the source on this side and we'll put the gate in the middle and we'll make the current travel longwards instead of downwards. And so this is called a lateral vent because it's going laterally and this is a vertical vent because the current is going vertically. And the nice thing about the lateral vent is you can then here you can make the connections to the other side, and you can mount these the silicon or you know whatever the material is directly onto the flange. So, um, so that's what I call vertical lateral. There's also a company that decided what they do is make a vertical device like this. They just turn it upside down. I don't know, put it on. And it's like getting a cake. Mm -hmm. Very carefully lifting it up and going on, and making all the connections on the other side. And it was very good actually, it worked, but the they actually built a machine that literally had, had the base of the transistor there, the trans semiconductor there, and it literally, this machine to micro micrometers, lifted this thing up and put it down and made connections underneath. But, <laughs> uh, but the cost was so much compared to the lateral device. So, um, okay, so next slide. All right, I'm going to say. That's it. So, um, so we're talking about uh, package. So, underneath the, uh, to actually get uh, in the in the case of um, in the case of a in the case of a um, say a vertical uh, device like this. Uh, so this becomes the this becomes the drain. So let me just draw this transistor here again. So this is the Source, this is the drain, and this is the uh, gate. This is the input, that's the output, and this is ground. So, this is this is the drain, that's the output, and um, that's the gate, and this is the source. So, what they had to do was mount this thing on a block of, of an insulator and then mount that on the flange. Okay, so this is a flange with the screw holes going through. You know, probably on the whole thing. Oh. Like this. So here, um, the, the connection would carry on through, and there would be your drain. Um, this input here would be the, uh, the gate, so bring the wire around to the gate, and then the source. Let's just have lots of source wires going down to here, like this. And um, you could switch to the this mm -hmm. on that. and I'm going to go. Uh, what do I want to video? Aren't we? 
So, um, try and uh, this isn't the best mic. This camera is the biggest <laughs> rubbish out, and it's all I can find. So, uh, what you can see uh, here, I think it's like minimum. Um, yeah, so that's on minimum. But of course, with the camera on, it's changed all the. Uh, but I'll, what I'll do is I'll just take you across this transistor. So here's the uh, connection. Well, let me just let me show you the transistor to start with. You know what the thing looks like. Yeah. yeah. That's it. All right. Okay. So what we've got here is on. It's actually a pair of transistors on one frame. These are the drains at the bottom here. And these are the gates at the top. And the um, uh, inside, it's slightly, more more traps. Mm. slightly more complicated inside, but I'll take you through it. So uh, here's the oops. Here's the drain connection here. This is the bit that the corner snipped off, so that's the drain connection. So we'll follow that down, and then we get inside. Now, can you see the wire bonds? Those wires going across. Oops. Oh, I should have brought my pointer with me. So, um, so these here are the bonds connecting the uh, connecting the lead, the outside lead. Um, if you haven't got the transistor yet, I will explain why in a minute. Oops. There it is. Uh, I think I need to start with a better transistor. <laughs> a bigger one, sorry. Let me see if I can get a lower frequency thing, something a bit bigger. Bigger dimensions. Oh no, this will do it. Now this is a transistor. And it's a, <laughs> it's actually one inch square lump of copper underneath this thing. It's built for the military. And it was called a hog pack. It's actually named after a guy called Bobby Granberg. All right, okay. It's a lower frequency device. It's a lot easier to see what's going on. I'll turn it down the right way, that is. See the sound. Oh, the dies are inside goes on. Right, so, um, okay. So what you, when you look at this, sorry, as I say, this camera really is rubbish. It's the camera, not the microscope, that's a problem. But each, this, uh, where are we? <laughs> there we are. Each one of the, you see this herringbone here? See it, uh, you see lots of little lines? going across here. Each one of those is an individual transistor. There are thousands and thousands of transistors in there, all connected together. And then each group of, there's probably about uh, two or five hundred transistors here, and that five hundred transistors is then connected to this point here, and then it has a wire bond, that this wire bond is then connecting it to the other side of the world. Um, so you're just looking at one of the die there, and there's uh, one there, there's a, another one there, and then there's a, it's backwards, sorry. And there's another one there, and then if I come across, there's another one there. See all the thousands and thousands of transistors there are there. So <clears throat> what I'm saying was is that you can't build one big transistor because the capacitance kills it. So what you do is you make thousands and thousands of small ones and connect them all together. And that's how you overcome, that's how you get the power and the small size. And that's how you overcome the capacitance. <coughs> capacitance, that's how you overcome the capacitance. And, um, and that's how you also get the heat out as well. So, um, so that was an early attempt at doing it. So that was 600 watts uh, transistor. Um, but uh, uh, not that one. Yeah. I took out. Not that one. Um, yeah. 
So this is a this is one point two kilowatts. <laughs> <laughs> One point two kilowatts right. in that size. What's, what's the heat sink? Big. Oh, I'll come to that. <laughs> um, they're actually, selling, there's some of these devices in here at the moment. So, so this is one point two kilowatts. I put it on the microscope. Um, and I've normally got a microscope, which has actually got. Uh, it's, sorry, the picture really is rubbish, but. Uh, Um, so you can start to see the those little boxes. You see, it looks slightly different the way it's being set out, but um, each one of those little boxes that you're seeing is a transistor. And there's loads and loads. Now you get to the metal bit in the middle, and then there's a load more on the other side. Do you see all the little wire bonds at the top there? Mm. They're going, oh, so yeah. it's going from the output connection here, and there's a wire bond coming down. <laughs> yeah, down here, and then joining on down here. Yeah. So, um, so, um, so if we flip back to the um, presentation again. Yeah, so it'll come back, it'll be there. Oh. Come on. That's it. Okay. Um, so uh, we, we were talking about packaging um, and, uh, and the thermal thermal resistance. So the idea with this is that the less we can get between the transistor and the and the heat sink, the less uh, rise in temperature we have. And in the past, this was actually measured in uh, in degrees per watt. So if you take an old transistor, um, it may be sort of five degrees per watt. So for every watt uh, uh, power into the through the transistor or dissipation of the transistor, um, the temperature rise would be say five degrees. So as the dissipation went up and up and up, even if you kept the heat sink at uh, at, uh, 20, uh, at 75 degrees C, the transistor might be running at 150. Just because the resistant, the thermal resistance between the, uh, the material and the and the ground. Today we've got that down to 0 0.01 or 0 0.009, that sort of number, and that is the reason why that is a one kilowatt transistor, because you can suck the heat out of the device. So, um, so uh, let's talk about amplifiers themselves. Um, normally in amateur radio, you talk about linear amplifiers. And the reason you talk about linear amplifiers is because, well, let's ask the question. If we were running CW, for instance, would we really need a linear amplifier? And the answer is no, it doesn't need to be linear because you're just switching the carrier on and off. There's nothing linear about it, it's either on or off. If we're transmitting FM, do we need a linear amplifier? No, you don't, because again, the amplitude is constant. So um, there's no linearity requirements. So uh, normally, uh, the only time you need a linear amplifier is if you're going to chart broadcasting single sideband AM um, or anything with a anything with an amplitude part to it. So if you've got a linear amplifier um, under CW, you can overdrive it as much as you like. It ain't going to make any difference. Um, well, until you break it, that is. Um, but if you're putting a uh, single sideband through it, if you overdrive it, then you're going to cause splatter because the amplitude isn't what uh, the amplitude waveform coming out isn't going to equal the amplitude waveform going in. Um, so, as I say, um, uh, so when we're talking about amplifiers, I know it's a radio, they're called linears because normally they are a linear. But if you're a CW man, you don't need a linear, you just need an amplifier. Um, so you need gain, you need output power, you need efficiency because obviously if you're putting 100, you know, if you're getting 100 watts up the aerial, but it's taking 500 watts out of your socket to do it, then you're getting 400 watts in the shack, which is all right in the winter day, but um, I don't know, 100 watts up the aerial. Uh, linearity, well, you only need it as I said if you're passing something through it, which is complicated. Um, you need ruggedness, um, and that is when I say ruggedness, it's not dropping on the floor. I mean ruggedness in terms of uh, uh, mismatch. When you're chinning the antenna and you haven't quite got a good match, 
you're going to get a lot of power reflected. So the transistor sees all of that power coming back, or the tube, whatever you're using. And the other area thinking about is harmonics. So um, no single one amplifier uh, will do all of those things. So for instance, if you're a CW man, you want gain, you want power, you want high efficiency, you don't want, in, you want linearity, you want ruggedness and harmonics. Um, so you would run your amplifier, you could run your amplifier in class C. If you put any sideband through it, it would really upset <laughs> the neighbours. But if you're a sideband man, then uh, you'd probably try and um, keep it more linear. So um, the, the next bit down there, I put class of operations. So we've got class A, B, A, B, C. Um, what that is, and I'll just uh, draw it out. I'm sure you know it. Maybe a refresh. So if this is your device, you turn it on and touch it up like this, and then it curves off like that. Actually, different materials behave differently. So, for instance, this would be a silicon transistor, which probably most of your rigs have got in them. But if you had one of these uh, GAN transistors, wherever it's gone, the shape is actually quite different. It actually goes up like this, and then it goes, and it, it's horrible. What's that? Try to find a linear bit on there. <laughs> I got a straight edge. Yeah, I mean, our, our type of our type of amplifier is not this pretty good straight bit there. You know, but this this device we can't find a straight bit. You looked. So um, so what we're looking for is a straight bit. So and normally what you do is uh, in um, this would be say class A. Let's get the right. Let's get the right uh, so this would be a silicon device. So this is our curve here. So we would go to somewhere here, which is I'm trying to straighten out a bit. Here we are. So we would actually operate the device there somewhere. So we put our uh, uh, we put our small input waveform here, and um, what we get out would be a bigger waveform. Um, but it would this and this would look like it. Look like it. So this would be uh, this is class A. If we run it here, if we put a waveform in here, um, then what would happen is, well, nothing. Because we haven't even got, this hasn't even got past the point of, so we have to put a bigger signal in here. Now, actually, now what happens is, now we're starting to, um, now we're starting to get output, so we're going to get uh, this sort of signal coming out. Now, this is uh, casting. And then um, uh, in between here somewhere, we've got uh, class B. And then um, there's another area here, which is known as class AB. The problem is here, for instance, uh, if this is, uh, this uh, might be drawing uh, on a large amplifier, you might be drawing five amps of current, even when you're not talking, because you've got this continuous current to, to try and keep you on the flat part of the curve. So it's very inefficient, very low efficiency. Whereas in class C, when you don't talk, there's actually no current going into the device at all. It's not biased on at all, the device. So again, if you're a CW man, you could uh, run class C quite happily, and uh, you'd have really high efficiency. Nice cold amplifier, and um, happy. But if you put a single sideband through there, what you get out would be nothing like what we put in. So um, then there are other modes. Um, You'll hear people talking about um, having using a class D amplifier, and the way that what's happening there is actually switching the pulses as they're coming through and changing the width of the pulses. It's a digital mode, and then um, uh, class E, F, and G are all methods of, uh, of trying to improve the efficiency. Next slide. How are we doing time wise? Done about an hour. How long have we got left? <laughs> If we want well, a tea break, well, then we can have it at the end. But uh, yeah. okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you what. We'll run through this bit, have a tea break, and then I'll uh, I'll do a, I'll do a calculation, and I'll actually show the actual design of a PA. Um, so uh, then we go on to what we call topology. So you can just get a single-ended, uh, uh, single-ended design, and I have got one. <laughs> so a single-ended design would just be where you've got a single transistor and a matching network on it. Um, then uh, you go into um, uh, push-pull, 
type of design, which is where you have two transistors and you operate them about 180 degrees out of phase with each other. And this is a push pull amplifier. You can see um, oh, push pull amplifier. You can see the transistor's got uh, two sides to it, and the, uh, the input is here. There's a transformer here, and this transformer is uh, a ballon, so it's converting the single input into a biphase signal, um, which is then operating the transistor and push pull. The advantage of push pull, push pull, uh, or one of the big advantages of push pull, um, is that um, the two waveforms are 180 degrees out of phase with each other, and it happens to cancel the second harmonic gets cancelled out. Here. So it means that in the filtering that you need to get rid of the second harmonic and, and the third harmonic, etc., um, uh, the second harmonic is suppressed naturally. So it means the filter really has to do very little work on the second harmonic, but it really has to kick in by the time you get the third harmonic. So if you're on uh, if you're on seven megs, then fourteen megs uh, would um, would naturally be cancelled out, and then um, twenty one megs would be uh, the, where the filter would have to kick in. So it actually makes the filtering a lot easier. And that's why if you look inside your rigs, you'll always find a push-pull device. There is another reason, and that is uh, we'll come to later, but it's to do with the impedance matching. If you uh, take a device, and instead of having a single device, if you split it, you've half the capacitance. You've half the capacitance. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and then, so each half has got half the capacitance. And then if you wire them in series, which effectively is what's happening here, then you've halved it again. So effectively, the input impedance to the transistor is now four times what it would have been. So, in, so uh, if this was, say, a one ohm device, you'd have to go from 50 ohms down to one ohm to, to match it. But if it was in push-pull, it would be 50 ohms to four ohms, which is a big difference. But if it was, say, a a five ohm device, then instead of being five ohms, it would be um, <laughs> uh, was it ten? It'd be uh, 20, 20 ohms. So it makes you know it makes a big difference in in running push pull. So you'll find most of these uh, these are actually push pull amplifiers. Um, coming back to um, matching, just quickly at low frequencies. At low frequencies, the matching is normally done, and this is a kilowatt amplifier, by the way. Um, so this, uh, this actually runs 1.2 kilowatts. So the transistor is sitting here, hence the heat sink. Um, and then the, most of the matching is done with a transformer. And the advantage about a transformer is it doesn't care what the frequency is, uh, apart from the ferrite. If you keep going up and up and up in frequency, the, fact, the poor little... Um, ferrite, bits of ferrite inside there, which are um, working with the magnetic field, um, they get, they, uh, they start getting worn out, sort of keep turning backwards and forwards and they start getting hot. So, um, so most HF amplifiers, if you open your rig, you'll just see a smaller version of this. Now, I've got a question. Here's one amplifier on a heat sink. It's an identical. Amplifier, but on a different heat sink. Now, which of these two gets hotter when they're running the same power? The only difference is the heat sink. So you think this one gets hotter? Yeah, that's what I think. About this one. This one's a hell of a lot heavier. You think that would be? Yeah, you'd have thought this one would be hotter. Actually, this one is cooler than this one. And the reason, the reason is, first of all, the transistor is sitting on what we call a heat spreader, because you've got a kilowatt of heat to get rid of here. And they're running about 50% efficient, so a kilowatt up the aerial and a kilowatt into the heat sink. Um, so the first thing we do is actually put it onto a heat spreader, because otherwise what will happen is the aluminium heat sink will just get a hot spot in the middle and the, and the rest won't. So we first of all spread the heat spread the heat using a copper block and then that helps but what's happened is that this thing looks great what you'll notice is is that uh, the heat um then has to travel down here oh and somebody's somebody's milled a hole through the middle right where the heat wants to travel 
So it has to travel all the way down here, and then to get to this fin, this fin, this fin is so far away from the source of the heat, it's not doing anything. It's just adding to the weight. It looks good, but it's just too far away. Um, whereas with this, the um, since the heat hits this plate here, it's go getting straight to a fin. And yeah, this actually runs cooler. This one. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? So whoever designed this, cut that bit out of the middle there to, um, to take some of the weight out. But the, the, the problem was it took it out the wrong place. <laughs> it's exactly where the, where the metal is. Um, uh, let me see. So uh, we don't push pull hybrid combiner. Well, a hybrid combiner is uh, this type of arrangement. So the reason for this uh, is that what we're trying to do here is uh, try, trying to cover a very wide frequency range. So what happens is, is that the transistors um, aren't matched at every frequency. So what we do is we optimize the match at the highest frequency. And as the frequency goes down, um, the gain increases. So what we're doing is optimizing the match at the high end where the gain is low. And then at the low frequency, you've got more gain, but the match is poor. So and this, this arrangement of what they're called hybrid, hybrid couplers, they just look like copper wires, but they're not. They're actually, they've got two wires inside. It's called sage wire line. And what happens is, is that when it's not matched, the power is reflected. But when it's reflected, it doesn't end up in the stage before. It ends up being dumped into a load. I can see it. Yeah. So for instance, here, let's do it on the bigger stage. So here, for instance, the power that's being reflected actually ends up in this resistor here. And then this previous stage, the, uh, it ends up in that resistor there. It's getting smaller because the power is going down. So the, but the idea of this uh, mechanism is that you're balancing the, uh, the reflection, um, uh, the mismatch. You're allowing it to mismatch, but you're allowing it to mismatch where the gain is higher. By balancing the two, you're able to keep a flat gain right across the band. So this was, as I say, 470 megs to 860 megahertz. Um, a bit old tech, but you wouldn't build it like that now because transistors have got better. But that was the technique we used. When did digital television come in? I can't remember now. Um, it's another, another combining technique here. So uh, this one here, the transistor would be here. It's combined here, uh, push pull. So each transistor here is a push pull transistor. Then they're combined here with a, a, a hybrid, which I just discussed. This is a same thing, but on a printed circuit board. And then the output comes up here. And then here's another combiner here. And this is just called an N-way combiner. What happens is you've got 50 ohms in parallel with 50 ohms in parallel with another 50 ohms, which makes whatever it is, 12 and a half ohms or 15 ohms or something. And then this is just a matching network which converts the 15 ohms back to 50 again. And um, because it was trying to cover quite a wide frequency band, you can see it's, called, it's quite sort of a complicated array. Um, but if it was just a single frequency, um, then you'd just be a quarter wave line. Just choose it at the right impedance line and you can do it at one frequency but if you want to cover a wide frequency you have to play around and put in try and compensate it but so this is called an n-way combiner that's called a quadrature combiner and this is a push-pull combiner so using all three techniques on the same amplifier. Um, we get to on there uh, anyway, Doherty. Doherty is a weird thing, designed by a guy uh, in the uh, 1930s. And the idea is if you were transmitting something like single sideband and you want really much, actually it's designed for AM really. When, when you're transmitting AM, you've got a carrier and then when you broadcast, you're getting peaks. But so uh, the peaks are quite infrequent. So um, what do you do, what, how Doherty works is you have two amplifiers. One which is the main amplifier and the other is a peaking amplifier. And what happens is as the, as the AM waveform hits its peak, the second amplifier kicks in. So the two are biased at different points. So that it's only when you hit the peak that the second amplifier actually joins in and puts in the extra power. 
Um, that's a very simplistic view of how it works. Actually, it's a bit cleverer than that. Actually, what happens is, is that um, uh, the second amplifier is actually changing the, the match on the first amplifier. So it's a bit like driving down the road with your foot on the accelerator at certain revs. And when you want to go fast, don't just keep changing the gear. <laughs> I'm in third now, I want to slow down. Second, I want to speed up. Fourth, and that's what it's doing. Um, it, uh, so it's actually called uh, it's actually called load modulation. And so um, uh, that's uh, that's a technique. And the, in today, um, uh, although it was used in AM transmitters in the 1930s, today um, cellular radio, uh, all your cell phones, all the base stations. It's all got some very, very peaky. The difference between the maximum power and the minimum power when you're sending information over the cell phone network is about 10 dB, or 10 times the power between the minimum and the maximum. And more or less everything is using this dirty technique. Um, it creates havoc with uh, distortion. But what they do is they put other systems in to, because they just they put the doherty system in to create um, uh, efficiency so it's really highly efficient but it creates a lot of distortion but then what they do is they put some clever electronics in to correct the distortion and that is what's going on in here now this i actually had to take all the metal work off this because this had a layer of metal work on it and another layer of electronics and another layer of metal work on the top it's a horrendous machine it's at 2.3 gigs it is a cell phone uh, amplifier and um, what you'll notice is um this thing i'll unplug it it had to be plugged in because all the metal work above it uh, is there's this thing. Two rolls of semi-rigid coax with plugs on the end. What's that doing inside an amplifier? Well, the answer is, is that it's a system called uh, feed forwarding. And um, I'll quickly draw it. Um, so so this is a linear amplifier. The cellular signals are very, very complicated. So what you have, you have your main amplifier, you put a signal in and what comes out is distorted. Because it's not very linear. It's running class C or A, B or something like that. So what you do is you have another amplifier here. And what you do is you, um, and I have to, uh, effectively what you do is you take, actually I should have drawn that amplifier over there. So you take the input signal, you take some of this signal and you attenuate it and you add the two together. What happens is if you put two tone signal in, you know, because one, one way of measuring an amplifier is if you put two tones in, you should get two tones out. You know, I'm going to do a two tone signal, signal test. So you put two tones in and you get two much bigger tones coming out. But unfortunately, you get uh, these little sidebands appearing because it's not linear anymore. So what this does is it compares this against this, it subtracts one from the other. What comes out are the two, um, the, the, the main tones are cancelled out, and the, um, these two here appear here. So what you do is you amplify that and then add it back in, cancel it out. So what then happens is you get the two big main tones here, and these two and these uh, little ones here disappear totally. They're cancelled out by what's coming out of here. And that's called the feed forward. Mm -hmm. Problem is, is that, um, that's not there. The problem is, is that the signal's coming down here, but then it has to travel through here. But that's slower than that. Yeah, so it's going to do is get a bit of delay, aren't you? You've got to, yeah, so you have to put a bit of delay in it, send it down a bit of wire to slow it down. But this one here is traveling faster than the signal going through there. So you have to put another delay in here. So you end up with a delay there and delay there. And what's it? There. That's what that is. That's what that is. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's a delay line. line. It's a delay line, two delay lines. And uh, as I say, this amplifier is designed in such a way that um, uh, actually. Uh, the, um, the signal uh, comes down here, through here, goes through multiple stages, finally ends up at these two big power fets here, 
and then through this thing here called a circulator, oh, yeah. which we can't use in amateur radio because they only work at microwave frequencies, but they, they protect uh, uh, any reflected power um, that's uh, reflected off the aerial ends up in this load here. And then there's some circuitry here that detects that, and if it detects it's too high, it shuts, up, shuts the whole thing down. These two power transistors are protected. So, um, but this wire here is the interesting one. This is the, what the sample that goes back into there, and um, so the whole thing just becomes a loop. So, uh, as I say, that's 2.4 gig amplifier. So, um, a lot of people take these things and modify them for 13 centimeters, is it? Yeah. 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 So, okay. Um, feed forward and pre correction. Pre correction is where, um, in, the, in years gone by, we used to use pre correctors in television transmitters. The transmitter would distort the television signal, and so you used to sit down with this big box of tricks. And it was a big box of tricks, and uh, every time the if the amplitude went up and it didn't quite follow it, we'd actually put the pre corrector in so that the, the signal going in was distorted in the opposite way that the amplifier would distort it. So if it was starting to compress it, for instance, we'd put extra gain in, put extra signal in. To, to compensate it. If the phase started to move one way, we put the phase in, in the opposite direction. But there was normally about 50 little pots that you had to tweak. And then um, I think you probably had to work for the company for about three years before you could actually set one of these things up in a week. Um, today, it's done by a single processor. Yeah. Now to put the signal in, the processor looks at it, works out all the coefficients, it produces thousands of different coefficients at every point in the, uh, in the amplifier. And uh, the advantage of it is that if the temperature change, when we used to do it by, uh, by preset uh, ones, when the temperature changed, everything would change. You know, it couldn't keep it over temperature, whereas the modern pre-correctors, um, so, so you have a linear amplifier, it's not very linear, but you put pre-corrector on the end and it, and it corrects it. And then all that splatter disappears. And uh, the sort of correction you can get is about 20 dB, which is 100 times. Mm. So, um, uh, so it's pretty effective. So if we stop at that point right. for coffee, and then what I'll do, if you flick over to the, um, onto the other screen here. Yeah. I'm just gonna say we're gonna take coffee, right? And we'll carry on. Um, I will flick over to the other screen in a sec. What I'll do, I'll, I'll just, this is what happens when it goes wrong. <laughs> Hang on. All right. Just quickly show you this. Right. I'll, uh, I'll try and show this what you want the video. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, just trying to find it on here. Yeah. Mm. I think if the camera is actually dropping under the. Uh, it's actually dropping under its own weight under the weight of the camera on there. Yeah. You can't actually see it very well. But um, there's the die. It's actually a low, that's actually quite a low frequency scene. You can see it's quite low power, the die is quite small compared to the other stuff they're showing here. Do you see do you see it's miss uh, cool. this area here? Yeah. Where is it? <laughs> yeah. That area there, yeah. that's a complete blob of molten metal. So when this dye blew, not only did it blow itself, but it melted all the metal as well. And so when you have a big power amplifier, you normally end up like with this one here, not so much with this one, but if there's a power transistor, you normally end up with a lot of capacitance on board. And when the device fails, the, all the electrons that are in there end up absolutely cooking it. Well, you know what it's like when you put the screwdriver driver across a big capacitor, it's a big crack. And that's what happens to a transistor. <laughs> right, so we're going to take coffee, right? <laughs> we have an extension on time, so we can finish when we. Oh, oh, okay. All right. If we start dropping off, okay, so um, let's. Um, yeah. What it'll do, because uh, actually we said, uh, you know, how do you design a, how do you design a, is everybody still there? Yeah. <laughs> Almost. Yeah. 
Hang on a minute. That's all right. I've noticed. Yeah. I haven't switched it off. It's been going all the time. All right. Oh, dear. That's all right. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, I've been trying to get something sorted out so that, that, so that everyone right. on the Zoom gets the full script. All right. You've got that. Oh, yeah, oh that's minor, fine. Minor problem. Yeah, that's fine. So, did you want to go back to that? So, we talked about we talked about the power transistors, and we talked about the capacitance of the power transistors and the problem that causes, and we also talked about the heat and the, uh, the problem that causes. Um, but uh, now uh, we need to talk about matching. Well, we all know about matching because we're matching antennas all the time. Um, and so, um, just it uh, makes it easier because I can see that, see you up there now. Yeah. Is it? So, the question is, um, you know, with a power transistor. Um, uh, you know, the power transistor will have an output impedance and an aerial has a input impedance and we just got to match the two. But generally what we do is we go through 50 ohms. But in past, uh, amateurs didn't always go through 50 ohms. Quite often you build a transmitter and the output from the transmitter would be a, a 600 ohm twin feeder straight up to the antenna. Um, there's no reason it has to go through 50 ohms. It's just that it's convenient uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that most cable that you buy is 50 ohm cable coax. And of course, in the 19, I remember uh, somebody was saying that uh, pre war, uh, radio amateurs had never seen coax. Everything was twin feeder. Yeah. Um, so coax is a relatively uh, uh, young in amateur radio day, uh, talk. Um, so we use 50 ohms because a lot of our VSWR meters, etc., are 50 ohms. Um, uh, but then the question is, why 50 ohms? Why not 150? Why not 40? Why not 20 ohms? Why 50? Anybody know? Two point three. Yeah, exactly. You know, getting yeah. So uh, actually, what happens is with coax um, is that um, you've got the inner conductor, you've got an insulator and an outer conductor, and it so happens that um, you've got the uh, resistance, the you know the uh, resistance of the wire R, and uh, you've also got the the loss of the um, of the insulator in the middle, and uh, it so happens that uh, minimum for minimum loss. And there's, it's a very comp. Uh, 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 you can actually look it up, and you 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 won't end up. You won't read the whole thing. <laughs> but for minimum loss, um, for the materials used in co in coax, for minimum loss, um, it's seventy five ohms, which just happens to coincide very closely, seventy as you say, to the center impedance of a dipole, which is very useful. But for maximum uh, for um, for maximum power handling. Uh, and that is where the uh, the cable's not going to burn up, or uh, in one direction it's not going to get hot, or in the other direction it's not going to arc over. You know, put too much stress on the on the insulation. Then the answer is uh, something like seventy five. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, fifty five ohms. I think it is something like that. And then um, there's a few stories of how it got to uh, fifty ohms. I think it went from uh, down to fifty two ohms because it just so happened that if you've got uh, two particular sizes of pipe uh, that were American standard um, uh, drawn pipes in copper and put one inside the other, it produced uh, 50 ohms. And so that's how they made solid uh, 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 rigid coax, just by putting one copper pipe inside another. It's a bit like having a 20, million, 20 millimeter uh, central heating pipe inside of uh, 22 millimeter central heating pipe. If you put spaces in there, you'll end up with an impedance. But it just so happened that uh, 50 that worked out at 52. And since then, I don't know why, but it slowly crept. Most people, it's 50 ohms. Although a lot of cables, if you look them up, they are actually 52 ohms. So, um, so what happens generally is with an amplifier, and if you take something like a um, uh, something like a valve amplifier. Uh, you might actually have something like a thousand ohms at the anode of the, an uh, the anode of the valve, and then you bring it all the way down to 50 ohms. You go through your VSWR meter, you go through your low-pass filter, you go down a piece of coax, back to an area of tuning in it, which then if it's on the end of a long piece of wire and it happens to be a, a half wavelength long, you bring it back up to a few thousand ohms again. Um, but it does have an advantage, and that is that every time you uh, change, every time you're using a, a network, 
to uh, change from one impedance to another, uh, it tends to only have a limited frequency range. And that is good because it acts as a filter. So if you take a situation like uh, this amplifier here, um, this uh, this is not using a uh, an act and this is actually just using a transformer, a broadband transformer. So this is using a broadband transformer here. So actually, this amplifier uh, will generate um, harmonics, and uh, those harmonics uh, will all go, uh, or the transistor will generate harmonics, and all of those trans all of those harmonics will go straight through that uh, fil uh, straight through this transformer, and all of them will come out here at fifty ohms. Um, but then, um, to, uh, to uh, compensate for that. The one with the heavy heat sink, that one. Um, to try and compensate for that, you can see that there's a low pass filter on the end of this one to compensate for the fact that there is absolutely no filtering effect by that transformer at all. It's just trans just converting the impedance. So, uh, so with this one here, for instance, I think it's got this the first turn on this. Um, uh, remember, this is a kilowatt uh, amplifier. Um, it's a, it's a, so the current on the primary here is massive. The primary turn is not the wire. The primary turn is the copper pipe that is actually inside here. It's actually a copper pipe, which is the primary turn. And in the secondary are the three turns of wire that's going through it. And so three turns on a transformer like this, it's a square. So it's nine to one. So uh, 50 ohms. It's about five ohms. At the transistor but because each transistor uh, it's um so it's five ohms so it's two and a half ohms per transistor and the two of then five becomes five ohms goes through the nine to one which produces the 50. and then it goes through the low pass filter so um i just wanted to go through um there's two ways of, um, of working out how to do this match. Now, non the simplest thing is uh, if you take uh, this formula here, uh, wherever it is, there. Actually, I think we'd better move this thing back up. Uh, no, that, that's oh. going out. That's, that's right. fine. That's, that's I'm going just about out. to switch over. All right. Okay. So, but uh, anyway, we've got the um, uh, we've got this uh, ZL equals uh, Z VCC squared over two PO, um, and what that is is that if you take Ohm's law, which is um, R equals V upon I, and if you mess around with that a bit, you end up with um, uh, power equals V squared upon R, um, and so um, so power equals V squared upon R. And so from that, if you flip it around the other way, you end up with. No, it's just. Somebody caught me in the air, and uh, I'm trying to do something else. All right. So power equals v squared upon r, and uh, if you turn that round, you end up with r equals uh, v squared upon power. And um, if you assume that uh, that the amplifier is only fifty percent efficient, then you end up with r equals v squared upon two power round po. And uh, that's a sort of a uh, rule of thumb for power amplifier designers. So, uh, as I say, you assume that the amplifier is fifty percent efficient, which is pretty pretty usual. Um, so you can use that um, to. So you can actually say uh, we know the voltage, for instance, would be twelve volts if it was your mobile in the car. We know what power we want. We want say, twenty watts out. So that would be 12 volts over 12 volts squared, 144 divided by two times 20 watts, which is 40, and that would tell you what the uh, what the load resistance would be, what what's needed uh, to to generate that power from that voltage. Um, so um, and that's what we use uh, as a starting point to uh, start the match. So we've got the transistor, we know how much power we want, we know what the voltage is, apply that formula, and that will tell you what the resistance is. Um, so if you then flick forward a... What do you want? Let to go to another... Next uh, slide. Yeah, I think that's all this thing to come up and I'll change it. Oh, okay. there you go. So here's a power transistor. Here's a typical uh, data sheet for a power transistor. Um, this is a um, 300 watt tran transistor, 50 volts, um, and, um, and it's a bit blurred and I can't read it. But effectively, that first screen there, uh, you'll see it's push pull. 
Um, I think if we go to the next, uh, and actually at the bottom there, I can read what it actually says there. there. This is the uh, thermal resistance here. Right, zero, zero, five, nine, and point one, nine. Right, zero, point zero, zero five. Yeah, zero, five. Um, point zero, five. So what that is saying is for every watt uh, that's being dissipated in the transistor, the uh, the heat, the flange of that will heat up by, uh, by point, 0.05 degrees C. So, uh, and, 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 and that's one of the reasons why these modern transistors are so powerful, because we're able to suck the heat out of them. Mm -hmm. So if we flip to the next sheet. Oh, sorry. That's all right. That's all right. Next, that's all okay. So uh, and I was talking earlier on about capacitance. Uh, and uh, 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 switch capacitance. Thank you. Yeah. And um, I'm trying to put this transistor back together again. <laughs> um, so you've got three capacitors here C in, C out, and C, uh, C feedback. No, actually, it's not. I know that's a C feedback because it's small. That's a C in, unless it's a C out. I can't read it, but I know the, just by the shape of the numbers. So, um, so what we've got here, we, um, let's read the body. I think you're going to run out of paper. There's actually more paper. Yeah, okay. it's good. It's still good. I'll use that. Right, right. So, so what we're saying right. now is we've got this transistor uh, like this, and we now want to uh, we now want to match this uh, to the outside world. So uh, we just use that uh, formula. Um, um, uh, RL equals uh, CC squared over two P out. And that tells us what the resistance of the transistor is. Um, but there's also a capacitor here as well. And that capacitor in this particular case is uh, 76, is it? 76 picofarads. Uh, oh, so you can see on here a lot better. You can see on there. <laughs> yeah. Just so um, so this is our output impedance of the, of the transistor. What we've got to do is match that. To, uh, match that to the uh, to the uh, to the 50 ohms. Actually, if you flip one more screen, some transistor manufacturers make it a bit easier. They actually do the calculation for you. So in this particular case, uh, if you take a hundred megs, uh, where are we? <laughs> there, there's a hundred megs. Yeah. There's the uh, there's the input impedance here, and here's the output impedance here. Now. You've got two, it looks a bit weird. You've got two numbers there. You've got a nine plus J eight, whatever the heck that means. <laughs> yes. And um, I don't want to take you back to school, but effectively the nine bit is the resistive bit, and the J eight yes. is the capacitive bit yeah. here. Um, now the other thing to notice is that um, here's the device. And the arrows are pointing towards the load, and they're also pointing towards the source. So um, uh, when you match something, if you've got a 50 ohm resistor, and, it's, uh, and then you add a little coil in series with it, you've now got a resistor with a coil, with a coil there. We don't want, we just want the 50 ohms, not the coil. So I can get rid of it. Well, take the coil away. Well, what happens if you can't get rid of the coil? It's still stuck there. So the way to get rid of it is just to put a bit of serious capacitance there. And the capacitor and the coil cancel each other out. One's got a plus J, the other's got a minus J. And if the J and numbers are the same, they cancel each other out. So what's happening here, wonder makes it's saying plus J 9.8, looking that way. Which means if you're looking back towards the transistor, it's not plus, it's minus. So, um, so that plus 9.8 is the coil, and actually the transistor has got a bit of capacitance. It's the other way. So, um, so that's how you start. So what I'll do now is I'll bring up the, uh, if you could flick. Yeah. No. So this is the Smith's chart, and uh, the first time I ever saw one of these was when some guy from Crawley Radio Club came down to 
uh, came down to our club and, uh, and I was a 14 year old or 13 year old or whatever it was and I could not understand all these capacitors and inductors and resistors and it, none of it made any sense to me and he put up this Smith chart and suddenly bingo I could see it so let me explain it there's 50 atoms here now the thing about this screen is it's not. <laughs> just restart on there. Let me just uh, shut it. Try and start it again. Here we are. Right. I'll just move it across. I can't see the screen. Yeah. Okay. So let me move the curse around. So that's 50 ohms. So you can see uh, this is the uh, this is the 50, this is 50 ohms here. That's the, that's the resistive fit. And then um, if we move uh, up, it looks inductive. It's a coil L, as mentioned in mini Henry's. If I move down, that becomes a capacitor. And it's still got 41 ohms. So if I stick up, if I go here, I'll actually lock it onto here. So if I travel around this line here, you can see it stays at 50 ohms, but we've got a, an inductor in series with the 50 ohms. And if I come this way, still 50 ohms, but we've got capacitor. Now, if I unlock this again, I'm free now. So I come around the outside here, there's no resistance. It's just a pure capacitor around the outside here. And this is a pure inductor around here. If you notice here, this is zero ohms. It's actually short circuit, so it's just a capacitor with a short circuit. And if I come around to the, this end of the chart, you'll see, if I can actually get it to work, but you'll see it's thousands of ohms. Okay. You guys, uh, you guys uh, getting a bit of a blurred picture, but uh, hopefully, so we'll move it back to the middle again. So what this chart is actually doing is it's showing every possible value of every single resistor you've got and every single capacitor or inductor you've got. And this is showing what happens when you connect them in series. And you'll see that it's measured in ohms. Uh, it's measured in uh, in peds in ohms. Now, if you take those two same components and you connect them in parallel, that happens. And instead of being measured in ohms, we now measure it in one over ohms. I know it sounds crazy, but <laughs> <laughs> so we can go from series parallel, series parallel, series parallel, very easily. Um, and the fifty ohm point here. I'll just move that back to 50 ohms. But that Smith chart looks wrong to me that way around. But, so that's 50 ohms there. And this is, what's it saying? 20 milli Siemens, which is Siemens is one over ohms. Well, actually, one over 50 is 20 milli. Yeah. Right. So it's the same thing, it's just different language, that's all. Uh, this is Chinese, and uh, that's English. So, uh, that's impedance. What did we say it was? I did actually note this down just to make sure I didn't go wrong on this one. You know what they say? Don't don't uh, don't um, get on the stage with children or dogs, isn't it? <laughs> um, or, or animals. And uh, likewise with the, with this with this program. Um, what we said was that that impedance was uh, nine um, was nine uh, nine ohms nine plus J nine. Let's see, yeah. I'm not, I'm, not getting, I'm not getting a very good picture. All right. It's all very low, blurred out. All right. So, um, so we want to go to nine. Uh, it's actually said that the output impedance was nine plus J nine. So, um, what I can do is come around here and find it wherever it is. Well, there's a simple way of getting there. Um, just locate a point. Um, so, and, uh, uh, nine. Now, you know what I said? It said nine plus J nine, but actually it was pointing in the wrong direction. So it's actually minus, mi nine minus J 
J nine nine yeah, minus J nine. Slightly better. Yeah. Minus nine. Do you want me to push it? That's right. Minus nine. I'll get what they get. So there's the point. There's our starting point. I'll mark that. I know how to do it. Trace. Trace on. Yeah. So, um, so that's where we're starting. Now, the next thing is we've got a, this transistor. We need some DC. So here's your uh, here's your uh, transistor. Um, first thing is as an amplifier, we actually need to put some DC in, uh, you know, plus uh, plus uh, plus twelve volts or whatever it is. We need to get that on without allowing the RF to go up the way. So we actually need an inductor in there to start with. So rather than just we could just put a choke in. That's what we do with. RF power amplifier uh, with valve amplifiers, you just put a whacking grade with choke in there, and um, RF wise, it's just not there. But we can actually put, we can use this to our advantage. We can make this part of the matching. Mm -hmm. So I'll do that. So let's uh, put an inductor in there. And the easiest thing to do here is uh, let me see, that, that is shunt, because this is effectively here is RF round. It might have 12 volts on it, but it's still RF ground. So this is a shunt component. So just quickly um, is there's this there's this mode called reference mode. And what it will do is it will reset this to zero. Now if I move it, it will tell me what we're actually moving from to. So um, and I'm going to, I've fixed it so that we're going to follow this contour. So we're going to follow this contour here. And we end up on the baseline there. So I've now got rid of that. We're back on our resistance line now, if I flick it. And the value of that is 28.7 nanohenries. 28.7 nanohenries. Now that there. picture got bigger, so you can see what I'm doing. If I switch back over. It should chart back over again. So now we're at 17 ohms. That point is now 17. So it's moved from 9 to 17. So we're going in the right direction. We just need to get to 50 now. So I'll play another little trick here. Um, I'll just add a little circle in here. Right, so now we want to get to here. And the way we do that is we go up here, down this line here, and down this line here. So what we do is we um, put the reference mode back on again. No, we set this to zero. Put the trace on again. And then we move this point from here. No, it's doing it because it's too fine. That's all. Up to there. So that's 38 nanohenries. So now what we've done is we've put an inductor in here. 38 nanohenries. It's not wrong. It's flipping and doing it. Okay. If I switch the trace mode off again, you can see we're now. Oops. So now we're stuck at uh, 17 ohms, which is what we had before, but we've now got 23 plus 23. So that looks uh, inductive. Which is that inductor we've just put there. But we really want to get to here, 50 ohms. So we need to, to get from here to here, we need to go shunt again. So okay. go to the that and chart there. Make any difference. Now we've got a line that will take us from here to here. So by the time we've done that, put the trace on, make reference mode again. And now it's all set to zero just because it's on. Okay. Yeah, take your arms away, and then it needs to come. Come. Oops. That one, maybe. Yeah. 
Wires. The wires got its own idea. It's not, it's not something. Um, about that. Uh, just no, I think Stella's in the way of the projector, so I'm not. Right, okay, leave it at that. Okay, so I've just any better burn. I've just set the um, I've just set the point here. Um, we, we came from here and then up to here, and now we get to from here back down to here. So I've just uh, reset the reference mode on again. And then all I need to do is come from here and drag it down this line to here. 42 picofans. And there's your 50 ohm point. So there's your output matching network. So 12 volts on there. 28 nanohenries there, 38 nanohenries there, 42 picofarads there, and you've got 50 pound, 50 pound down. Do you want to do the input? <laughs> it's the same in reverse. So, um, so that's that's how you use a Smith chart. Now, this uh, you can do it with a paper Smith chart. It's just that um, you don't have this uh, column on the right hand side doing all the uh, maths for you. <laughs> Uh, you can do it. Uh, it's just that you just have to know that you know X C yeah. yeah, but uh, but uh, effectively, uh, it, it's only a matter of multiplying uh, the Smith chart. So uh, the center of the Smith chart is is one, and uh, if you're in a fifty ohm system, you just multiply everything by fifty. So it's uh, so that's uh, um, so that's how we match the uh, the output of that transistor um, uh, to fifty ohms. And on your antennas, you're doing exactly the reverse. You're just going from 50 ohms. And if you, um, um, uh, what you notice is in this particular case, it's of a low pass. You'll notice that uh, uh, if you're going from a low impedance to a higher impedance, you end up with a series L shunt C. And if you're going to a the other way around, if you're going from a low impedance to a high impedance, you tend to go shunt C series L. And you'll notice that with your Antenna tuners. If you've just got an L and a C, um, and uh, you can't tune it one way, you just take it out and put it down the other, and it will take you from 50 amps downwards instead of 50 amps upwards. So, we can go back on the or is it be too strong to do that? I think we're done with that. Right. And do you want to do the input? <laughs> no, it's the same right. thing in reverse. That's right. Yeah, and just one last thing. I don't know if you've ever come across this thing called uh, 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 maximum power transfer. Theory. You know, maximum power transfer theory. Mm -hmm. Everybody maximum knows smoke, yeah. maximum smoke theory. Um, yeah, there's this, uh, and, and a lot of people um, uh, always say. Um, uh, you know that uh, you get everything has to be uh, absolutely conjugately matched, which isn't 100% true. It is when you're dealing with antennas, for instance, on receive. If you've got an aerial which is 72 ohms or whatever, then to, you want to get the maximum amount of energy out of the aerial into your receiver. So you want to match it. But if I was to give you a, um, a different example, and that was say, for instance, um, if you wanted to get maximum power transfer out of the national grid. Um, you know, if you want, if you want 60 watts in uh, light in your living room, you plug a 60 watt light bulb in. Or if you want a 20 watts somewhere, you just plug a 20 watt light bulb in. But it's definitely not maximum power transfer. Uh, you're just changing the load. Uh, you're, the resistance of the bulb is being changed depending on what power you want. And the same is true with RF power amplifiers. You might have a kilowatt transistor, but you might not want to have a kilowatt out of it. So you've got two options. One is to lower the supply voltage, or the other is to increase the load impedance. So uh, although this chart here told you what the load impedance is, 
they only gave that loan impedance for one particular power output power. Um, and so uh, if you want a different power, or if you want to, then obviously the, the numbers they're giving you are the wrong numbers. So, so that's why you, um, so as I say, a lot of people always quote maximum power transfer theory, et cetera. And actually that's not what you want. And the same is true with, uh, say, uh, in the morning when you start your car, if you really wanted maximum power transfer theory, what it says is that um, the load will draw the same power as uh, as being dissipated in the source. And in which case it would mean that the same amount of energy is being dumped inside your battery as actually into the starter motor in your car. So you'd end up with a red hot battery. So again, you don't use maximum power transfer when you start your car. <laughs> Definitely you don't. So um, uh, you do get a lot of energy starting a car, but it's not maximum power transfer there. So, um, okay, so um, any questions? <laughs> we covered a lot, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll just put out a thing to everybody that's left on the meeting, if it's great. But, uh, uh, next slide, I think, as well. Yeah, all right. Okay, well, I haven't quite finished. Okay, so. Oh, no, don't do that. Hang on. Oh, yeah, that's it. That's what I want. Next. Um, well, there's a typical, there's a typical design. Uh, yeah, one of the things about this is that obviously for time, I only did a simple match here. Oops. The issue is, is that if you do a single match, you saw on the, you saw on the, um, on the chart there that we went quite a long way out on the chart. What that does is it actually makes the amplifier very narrow band. So if you just wanted something for two meters, you know, 144 to 145 or something like that, that'd probably be fine. But if you wanted something which was broadband, then uh, it's, the, uh, the matching is too sharp. And so the way you get around that is you put multiple steps in. So on your Smith chart, instead of, uh, uh, instead of uh, going uh, up and then down as we did, uh, you can actually do lots of little hops to try and follow the center line. And if you do that, the amplifier, the, uh, the uh, change in with frequency becomes a lot less uh, critical. So, um, and in that particular case, I think there's uh, one, and the other thing you'll notice that there's a capacitor here, because obviously at this point, there's still 12 volts going to your aerial, so you need to somehow block that. Uh, and normally, rather than put some big value, you actually put something in which is, uh, which is a smaller value, and then you introduce that as part of the matching. Um, so, um, yeah, so if you go to the next screen, And uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Right. Can I send out a thing for any questions on there? <laughs> yeah. Probably will go to sleep. Yeah. yeah, well, I don't know. No, there seems to be somebody alive out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Still there. Uh, Bernie, Merv, um, I can't see who else at the moment because I'll cover them up. And John Barry. Oh, yeah. Ken's given up, then. Huh? Ken's given up. Well, he went a long time ago, didn't he? <laughs> uh, Ken, Ken has, yeah, he went, he went to the uh, coffee time. Oh, All right. right. Well, it doesn't look like there's anything here, so. Oh. oh, here we go. One quick question from uh, Bernie. for Bernie. Quick question for John. As a total no novice, is it feasible to build a 500 watt PA ourselves? Yes. There you go. Yes. Instant answer. Yes. Um, yes, um, quite easily. I mean, um, no, of course, you see it up on the. Uh, you effectively wanted to. A copy of this sort of circuit. That. Um, so, actually, I've got an even better one to show you. This one's easier to see. Um, so, um, where are we? So, here's the input. There's a, um, a push pull transformer. 
Uh, there's the transistor. You notice the transistor sitting under this, this plastic thing. Uh, that's because uh, the transistor is not soldered in. It's clamped. The transistor is actually clamped in. All oh, right. So um, it's useful for taking the transistor out, making measurements, changing transistors, etc. Uh, so that's why you can't see the transistor. And then here is the uh, here's the transformer. So you can see the primary is those copper pipes going through there and there. And then there's uh, about three turns of this wire. And this wire here, so it's coax, it's only just being used, just the outer braid is being used. It's just being used as a very heavy gauge wire. Uh, and then on the output, you can see it's uh, literally connected directly to the output connector there. And then there's a DC feed. Uh, the DC, the, the, uh, the transistors are connected to, to here and here. On the other side, of the transformer there's the two copper pipes and this is the dc feed here so um so it's actually that is a kilowatt so um depends how much back off you want i mean it's a 1.2 kilowatts really you should um for single sideband that would run 1.2 kilowatts cw uh, for single sideband you'd probably want uh, 800 watts maybe Obviously, the more you back it off, the less splatter you generate. But uh, that's it. And this is a 50 volt, uh, 50 volt circuit. And the reason you use 50 volts is that um, if you can imagine, uh, 1.2 kilowatts uh, is uh, this is probably approaching 20 amps at 50 volts. Yeah. Um, whereas if you did that at 12 volts, then you'd need 100 amps. So uh, you end up with a massive current. All the connections would be, um, well, it'd be like trying to start your car and those sort of currents. Yeah. Um, by the looks of it, John's put one up there. Uh, but again, this thing, you'd then need to put a decent filter on the output. Yeah. What's the other concern? I don't see any signs of supervisories. Could John say and it's something about supervisories that would typically be used? Uh, don't quite understand what he means by supervisories. Um, well, I should well, imagine these sort of uh, things like, I don't know, current measurements or um, oh, ways of sort of shutting it down. And, right, right. Uh, uh, yes, um, the rest of the circuit. Um, so um, uh, VSWR, temperature, etc. Yes. Um, so uh, the, on, the, on this circuit, there is a, these uh, uh, devices that are uh, when you heat the transistor yeah. up, the bias point does move a little bit. And on here, uh, there is a very small amount of this is the uh, adjuster for the um, for the gate bias. And there is a diode just here. And so there's a very small adjustment. So as the amplifier gets hot, there's a, uh, there's a small effect to try and back off the bias um, to compensate for that. Um, but VS, these devices are extremely rugged. Um, and, but generally, the problem with VSWR is that um, with most uh, amplifiers is that by the time you've detected a VSWR and shut it down, it's too late. Mm -hmm. So um, you can see much power coming back out the jet mixture. Yeah, you, you've, you've heated up the transistor. Mm -hmm. There's three ways of breaking a transistor in my books. Uh, there's uh, over voltage, which is where you're actually literally ripping the semiconductor apart because of the electric field. Um, there's uh, overcurrent and there's over temperature, but the overcurrent, uh, too much current, is the same as too much temperature. So, um, and also uh, temperature affects the voltage breakdown as well. So generally, keep keep um, your amplifiers cool helps on both. Um, overcurrent, you tend to have some time to do something about it. So a VSWR network will be able to switch the amplifier off before it's too late. If you end up with serious over voltage, it's normally uh, curtains. As we used to say, it's, far, it's the fastest fuse on three legs. Yes, yes. Uh, generally, if you back off, if you take a device like this, so design it for 1.2 kilowatts and then run it at say 800 watts, then it becomes extremely rugged. And that's one of the ways. Another method you can use is uh, because voltage is a much more serious breakdown than current, because you don't have the time to do anything about it. Um, so uh, the other thing you can do is, is it might be a 50 volt device, run it at 40 volts. You'll lose quite a lot of power because, as I said earlier on, 
uh, the uh, power equals v squared upon r. So if you drop the power by half, uh, if you drop the supply rail by half, half the voltage, the, the uh, power will go down four times. Um, but if you go from, say, 50 volts to 45, 50 volts to 40 maybe, um, then, um, okay, you lose some power, um, but uh, you make the amplifier much more rugged. And, and, and another point on power is the, the thing to do, I know all us radio amateurs do it, we always think in terms of watts and uh, don't. Um, because uh, if you look at your S meter, one S point is 6 dB, uh, which is four times the power. So if you back off your amplifier by say 3 dB, that's half an S point. But from a ruggedness point of view, uh, you've just made sure that whatever happens to the area, you're not going to break the amplifier. And it also means splatter wise. So, the thing to do is not look at your power meter in watts. Uh, and another thing, <laughs> I, I had a friend of mine go out to, uh, out to um, uh, France, uh, to uh, Aramanche, you know, on the June the 6th. And he took two radios with him. He took a 50 meg radio, I uh, took a 74 uh, meter. Radio, uh, was it 50 meg? 50 meg, I think it was 50 meg radio. And he took uh, an HF radio uh, uh, on uh, 80 meters. And um, the 80 meter radio, the radio on 80 meters was a beach landing, World War II beach landing set, which had um, very low power. And um, when I looked at this, I thought, well, actually, from where I am in Chichester, it's 100 miles over, over the sea to get to there. So I thought, 100 miles, who's going to notice? So I stuck a 50 meg rig into this thing, um, which produced a, about 1.2 kilowatts. And then I stuck that into a five element <laughs> jargy. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing was, it's going out to sea, so <laughs> who cares? Um, and um, I thought, there's brute force and ignorance, isn't there? You didn't hear a thing. Not a dicky bird. But half an hour later, we put out a call to some people on the beach, on his beach landing radio, which was 0.8 of a watt on 80 meters. And I called him back. I could hear him, no problem. So it's 0.8 of a watt into a dipole versus 1.2 kilowatts into something which had about 8 dBs of gain, which is multiple kilowatts. Um, it ain't gonna go, it ain't gonna go, um, sort of thing. Can you say it's by the sea? Yeah, yeah, I'm just firing, firing it over the sea. But you know, 50 megs actually what happened, it went 20 miles along the sea and then just took off. So by the time it got to him, it was way up. The way way up. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so unless there's something up there to reflect it back, which obviously there wasn't, you're wasting your time really. So, yeah, so as I say, it's um, more to do with frequency than anything else. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's the end, yeah. folks. Share stopping. Cheers. And then this is a. Um, if you don't want to big heat sinks, this is the other way of cooling them.